Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Du Bois Bowman. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the University of Michigan School of Public Health. I'm glad you've joined us for our event, Bounded Justice, a critical appraisal of DEI. We're looking forward to remarks from Dr. Melissa Creary, an assistant professor of health management and policy at the School of Public Health, and an excellent conversation between Dr. Creary and Dr. Enrique Neblet, professor of health behavior and health education. You'll hear more about Dr. Creary in a minute, but before we begin, I wanted to offer my thanks both to Dr. Creary and Dr. Neblet for leading our event today. I also want to thank the school's DEI team for helping to organize our event. Dr. Creary's discussion about bounded justice is crucial to the work that we do as public health professionals, scholars, and students in pursuit of health equity. It's also important to us as a school community as our five-year DEI strategic plan comes to a close and we began evaluating our DEI efforts thus far. I'm really proud of the progress that we've made, made thus far, but there's so much more work to do. As we begin planning our future DEI efforts, Dr. Creary's discussion will offer important insights for all of us interested in pursuing health equity and creating a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive school. So thanks for being here with us today. And now with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Whitney, Whitney Peoples, Peoples, our school's, our school's director, director of diversity, of diversity equity, equity, and inclusion. And inclusion. Good afternoon. As Dean Bowman noted, I'm Dr. Whitney Peoples, and I am delighted to welcome everyone to our annual fall DEI event. I also have the great pleasure of introducing our featured speakers today, Dr. Melissa Creary and Dr. Enrique Neblet. I was reading the edited volume Toward What Justice, describing diverse dreams of education when I first thought about asking Dr. Creary to be this year's speaker. In Toward What Justice, co-editors Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang invite their reader to engage deeply with the idea and project of justice. In particular, they ask the reader to reimagine justice, not as a static destination to which we aspire, but as an imperative that guides and demands our best practice in the service of some new as yet unrealized and perhaps unimagined future. In this way, in Tuck and Yang's way, justice becomes a continuous call to action and accountability as we dismantle and remake the world in the image of wellness, health, wholeness, community, and belonging. Tuck and Yang's conception of justice is a reminder of the iterative and long form nature of equity and justice work. And of course, while reading this, I could not help but think about Dr. Creary's transformative framework of bounded justice, which she will share with us today. So as we reflect on the first five years of our DEI strategic plan, and as we look forward to what we might imagine for the next iteration, of the strategic plan. We are incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Creary share with us new tools and new frameworks to guide us in our equity and justice focused work. As Dean Bowman noted, Dr. Creary is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Management and Policy, and she is also the senior director of the Office of Public Health Initiatives at the American Thrombosis and Hemostasis Network. Her areas of study include race and racism, genetics, identity politics, health policy, and health equity. And she has over 20 years of bench, public health, and social science research experience, including her work as a health scientist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and her extensive field work in Brazil. After her talk, Dr. Curie will be joined in conversation by Dr. Enrique Neblet, Dr. Neblet is Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education and Associate Director of the Detroit Community Academic Urban Research Center. He also very generously serves as one of the school's DEI faculty leads. Dr. Neblet is one of the leading U.S. scholars in the areas of racism and health, 
And in particular, he focuses on understanding how racism related stress influences the mental and physical health of African-American young people. The combined expertise and experience of Dr. Creary and Dr. Neblet promise for a thought provoking and generative exchange. So without further ado, I welcome Dr. Creary to share her remarks with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Peoples, for that lovely introduction. And hello to all of you, colleagues, students, and friends. I am delighted to be speaking to you today about my concept bounded justice and its implications to diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Thank you to Dean Bowman, Whitney Peoples, Michael Kasaborski, and Enrique Neblet for their time, energy, and investment in this event. To you, the audience, I ask that you bring your most vulnerable, open, and visionary selves to this talk today as we envision what could be for the Academy and for the School of Public Health. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to briefly discuss my positionality, the context of bounded justice and its application to DE&I work, our charge, and then this will be followed by a conversation with Dr. Enrique Neblet, as explained, professor in health behavior and health education. As we move through this talk this afternoon, I also want to say that uh, the title of this talk is about a critical appraisal of DE and I. I sometimes use the case of this university and school, but it should be clear that there are many units across the school and across the US that are struggling with these very conversations. Next slide, please. So I like to start my talks with a slide about my positionality. It helps relay to the audience who I am, but also what the stakes are for me when I'm giving a talk, how I might be situated in privilege or risk or both in relation to my topic. I am an STS scholar at the School of Public Health and value the methodologies of ethnography and oral history. And that means something when you're in a department like health management and policy, interdisciplinary, but also um, expansive in the ways that we think about health policy. Before I became um, that scholar, I was constantly playing the role of insider and outsider, someone living with sickle cell disease while also being a part of the public health apparatus at CDC that was creating policy at different levels for the sickle cell disease community. I think sickle cell as a site of interrogation is important to analyze aspects of equity and inclusion. Sickle cell disease is a biologically based disease that is not race limited, yet is associated with differential investment and treatment, which likely reveals racism as a root cause for disparity. Next slide, please. We are here today to talk about bounded justice. Uh, it's a concept, a conceptual framework, and a potential analytic for those interested in the design of policy, technology, and programmatic interventions towards health equity. And as a reminder to us all, the definition of health equity as offered by Paula Braveman is social justice in health. So I want you to be thinking about what that means um, to connect social justice to our practices for health equity. Bounded justice stems from the work I have done in Brazil studying health policy and equity processes via these policies to address not just the neglect of black health, but the societal neglect of Afro-Brazilians writ large. Universal law, citizen participation and policy formation, and intentional efforts from a number of social justice movements to address inequities within the public health system were ineffective due to the ability to address the underlying and deeper social inequalities embedded in individuals and communities, specifically those disadvantaged by racism. Attempts at health justice and reparation were bounded by larger social, systemic, and structural factors that were not recognized as part of policy and system building. Bounded justice suggests that it is impossible to attend to fairness, entitlement, and equity when the basic social and physical infrastructures underlying them have been eroded by racism and other historically entrenched isms. Next slide, please. In public health, we recognize that in order to attend to vertical equity, 
we must recognize that those with greater need should receive greater intervention or more resources. You all know the crates that represent the distribution of goods and resources in order to create an equitable environment. But what if we were to recognize that the intervention or distribution of goods and resources had to in fact dig deeper than what we assume? That in fact, in order to deliver the justice we intend, we must consider the population in historical and relational contexts across lifespans and generations. If we do not, then we should assume that the justice we too often laud ourselves for has just hit the tip of the iceberg. For those living with sickle cell, although some form of superficial justice may have been met, its reach was limited, particularly for the intended audience. Even though some intentional equity processes were created to benefit the most marginalized, these processes have not been enough to counter the long-term effects of marginalization. As a result, many were glad to receive the relatively small, yet realistically quite meaningful benefits that the Brazilian health policy distributes. Their response is not incommensurate with their awareness that these benefits are microscopic in comparison to the larger scope of civil rights that ought to be afforded to them as Brazilian citizens. And so bounded justice really asks us to think about the thin slice of justice that we may be offering through interventions, through programs, through policies and technologies, but how we often may uh, introduce this thin slice of justice without seeing these communities uh, in a more holistic and again, historical uh, framework. Next slide, please. So how might we turn this critique to the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion? In the same vein as Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang's Toward What Justice, mentioned earlier by Dr. Peoples, bounded justice might push us to think of justice as an imperative rather than an endpoint. What does it mean to always be in action towards? What this implies is that we never reach the endpoint. Bounded Justice asked us to consider the stamina necessary for DEI work within the academy, the School of Public Health, and within our own individual health related equity and justice projects. Next slide, please. So let's turn our attention to the School of Public Health here at University of Michigan. I have had countless meetings with prospective students and students who have choose to attend the school that specifically reference our mission and guiding principles. They come here prepared for experiences in and out of the classroom that will enhance their toolkit in the realm of health equity and will support their identities and lived experiences. But as Dr. Paul Fleming recently wrote in one of our grant applications, what we say and what we do are often far apart. In the book on being included, racism and diversity in institutional in institutions, Ahmed tells us the use of diversity and I add equity and inclusion as an official description can be a way of maintaining rather than transforming existing organizational values. When we say we are led by the values of DEI, we must do so understanding that the words are empty unless we do the additional work of attending to the messiness underneath. And when I'm thinking about the messiness underneath, I want you to think back to that picture of the pyramid. Um, often the terms and related efforts of DEI come across as empty. And like that pyramid from the earlier slide, it is just the tip of the iceberg. So we must dig deeper and like the actors in my research must consider the population in historical and relational contexts across lifespans and generations. Next slide, please. So in 2016, UM developed its first five-year strategic plan on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Each school, college, and unit was charged to produce their own five-year strategic plan, which we did, which will be integrated to create the overall UM strategic plan. We are now at the end of the cycle, as Dean Bowman uh, stated in his uh, video, where we will turn to data and analyses, and we will do what research institutions do best. 
We will interpret and disseminate the results. We will come over uh, the, the data and um, analyze appropriately. We will formulate new research questions. We will evaluate metrics of success and design new ones as we determine next steps. This is not unlike the process Paula Braveman asked us to deploy when monitoring equity in health and healthcare. In this article from 2003, which I highly recommend, she tells us that monitoring health equity is a scientific endeavor, but its fundamental objective is guided by values. If you remember from an earlier statement, health equity is social justice in health. And in its definition, Braveman points to the value of social justice as the guiding principle of health equity. Next slide, please. As we move toward contemplation of what comes after our first five-year DEI strategic plan, I invite us to embrace both the scientific rigor necessary for the monitoring of diversity, equity, and inclusion while being guided by values. Bounded justice invites us further to be moved beyond the maintenance of the status quo inherent in DEI work and move towards transformation. As depicted here, a dam at first glance protects and supports, but whom is it protecting and supporting? The institutions perhaps, but maybe not the students, maybe not the faculty of color, maybe not the staff who may be deemed tangential and not critical. The dam instead is limiting in potential, limited in vision and limited in reach. What might transformation look like then? What if instead, if we decided to pair the rigor of science in our equity monitoring and infrastructure building with the value of disruption? The strategic plan of 2021 cannot look like the strategic plan of 2016. This moment calls for us to do things differently and with a vision that is radical. This moment demands an interrogation of inclusion instead of a celebration of it. The concept of bounded justice requires that in the interrogation of inclusion, we actively work to disrupt the mechanisms of exclusion. It requires a new way of being, a set of new underlying values, a new institutional mission, and a new metric of success. Next slide, please. Matthew Johnson, who wrote Undermining Racial Justice, a case study of DEI processes at the University of Michigan, tells us that it is important not to confuse reform with disruptive institutional change. Reform introduces practices that can make the university more inclusive while preserving core institutional priorities. This book clearly articulates the problematics of deploying inclusive measures as a way to avoid a value shift which would lead to eventual behavioral and cultural shift. In Unsettling the, col the Colonity of Being, Power, Truth, Freedom, Towards the Human, After Man, Its Overrepresentation and Argument by Sylvia Winter. And those who have read Sylvia Winter understand that that title being a mouthful pretty much tracks with the way that her scholarship works. Uh, it's a lot to take in. Um, I invite all of us to engage uh, more with Sylvia Winter, um, even in our public health practice. But Sylvia Winter locates culture as the site of possibility and struggle for transformation. And you may have heard me say transformation over and over again since I've started this talk. And that's because that's really what Bounded Justice is asking of us. It's requiring transformation um, within all realms of the academy and within the school, the way that we do research, the way that we engage with community partners. It's, it's, it's asking us to go beyond the status quo of maintenance, of going beyond the status quo of just inclusion um, for inclusion's sake, and really changing the value set that again can lead to transformation. So what might help us get to this transformation? Anti-racism disrupts hierarchy, it disrupts whiteness, it centers the margins and questions disciplinary norms. Anti-racism can lead to institutional shifts. What if, for instance, we had a mission statement that stated a belief in vulnerability? How might that value diffuse through our classrooms, our research labs, and faculty meetings? Next slide, please. <laughs> 
We must be called to disrupt even when our peers and pinnacles do not. NIH is an example of an institution that needs transformation, but instead appeals to actions of inclusion through actions of reform. We see data here that shows Black and other racially marginalized scholars receive funding less than white scholars, and similarly, women receive less funding than men. The NIH may recognize that structural racism is an issue, and they have even put out a proposal to specifically understand and address the impact of structural racism, perhaps understanding that it is mostly scholars of color that do this sort of research labor. It is an attempt at remedying the disparate data that we see on the slide. However, these are just reforms as evidenced by the panel of reviewers, which is comprised of mostly white scholars who do not have a history of studying structural racism. While there is an attempt at addressing the funding gap for scholars who work on racism, until the NIH shifts their value system to recognize things like community-based research and research methodology on par as a clinical trial, or meaningfully includes impacted communities in the review of applications. These actions of reform just further the status quo and retain the overarching values of the NIH. What we need from NIH is transformative disruption that considers the holistic forces of oppression that the NIH and society writ large have forced scholars of color to contend with. Next slide. While I am honored to be delivering this talk highlighting bounded justice, I'd be remiss to mention the many, many people who have specifically interrogated the ways that the Academy has fallen short on justice and equity. I am reminded of a project I'm about to embark on that will explore hospital data sharing practices as a way to ensure equitable access to scientific advances. Black and brown patients have told us time and time again about their discomfort in sharing their medical data. Time and time again, there have been panels and papers and conferences and workshops that talk about the participatory need, um, the ways in which we should be responsibly engaging communities. Um, and yet, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my, I just lost my place. Uh, black and brown patients have told us time and time again about their discomfort in sharing their medical data. And yet, unless there are punitive practices in play, hospital systems continue with a problematic status quo. So too is the case of the academy. At this point, we have enough data to understand that there is a problem um, of, what, of what we need to do. And what we need now is the political will to invest in and undertake the risk of the work of disruption. There is a line in my Bounded Justice article that warns in the wake of the racial awakening of 2020, that the current charge of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives should cause some to pause with worry as many actors respond to performative, performativity politics. Bounded Justice recognizes that DEI programs and priorities are produced in fraught political and economic fabrics with an intention to achieve justice, reconciliation, and reparation for vulnerable populations. Further, these productions are based on good intentions and usually as a countermeasure to the indignities and inequalities taking place among certain populations. Anti-racist principles do not turn a blind eye to the understanding of how the broader social milieu of inequality has been inscribed in the very bodies being asked to participate. Next slide, please. So as I close, I am prompted to think about this table at the White House, um, a round table on improving the lives of Americans living with sickle cell disease. In September 2020, during Sickle Cell Awareness Month, the Assistant Secretary for Health and the newest White House champion for sickle cell wrote about the state of sickle cell disease care in the United States. And he said, Early in 2018, we established an interagency health and human service sickle cell disease work group to coordinate activities across federal programs, reduce duplication, and develop bold transformative initiatives. In September 2011, uh, almost a decade before, certainly 
um, yeah, about a decade before, then Secretary of Health Kathleen Sebelius made sickle cell disease a uh, health and human uh, services and institutional priority then as well. And she promised to create a comprehensive database to improve the care of individuals with sickle cell disease and better engage national and community uh, based advocacy efforts. So this loop of inaction is bedfellows with public performativity, a written or visual display of commitment to the same thing over and over again. And for the case of sickle cell disease, conveniently happening during the National Month of Recognition, but all the while never moving the proverbial needle enough to make a difference. As a result, those new to the loop of inaction are promised the same things that have already been promised, but with a fresh set of stakeholders who are enraged by the inaction and with it fresh attention for the performance of shared institutional disbelief and alleged commitment. All the while conveniently forgetting that the same exact processes have occurred many times over before an administration, a leadership board, or health official decides it's the cause du jour again. And so I leave us with this image of a September as Sickle Cell Awareness Month roundtable in 2020, which invited individuals, individuals and families with sickle cell disease to a White House table in the middle of a pandemic with very little masks in sight, despite the high risk status of the disease itself. At what cost is an invitation to the table worth for these particular patients living with sickle cell disease and for those who have stakes at a much higher level um, while you know, engaging within in the academy. So let us push to disrupt empty gestures of inclusion without the disruption of historical and contemporary exclusionary actions. Let us avoid the loop of inaction that would keep us stagnant and discouraged let us close the gap of what we say and what we do. And let us understand that justice is not the end point, but the imperative. So thank you so much for your time today. I am looking forward to the conversation with Dr. Neblet in just a few. Thank you so much, Dr. Curry, for those powerful words. And I will now turn things over to Dr. Neblet to get us started. Thank you, Dr. Peoples. Uh, I am delighted uh, to be here this afternoon uh, and to be in conversation uh, with Professor Creary uh, with her talk. Um, Dr. Creary, thank you so much for uh, your words of wisdom, uh, your work, uh, and your contributions. Uh, I think the bounded justice concept is bold. Um, I think it's courageous. Uh, it's certainly disruptive. Uh, and your scholarship really um, has done an excellent job of speaking truth to power. So I just want to start out by making a couple of those uh, points about what I like about the work. Uh, one of the things that's striking to me um, about what you've offered us is that you name uh, racism, you name systems of oppression as central to your analysis. Um, I remember um, at the beginning of the pandemic, when I suggested that racism should be central to our understanding of disparities, um, there were people who doubted um, whether racism played a role. And so I appreciate that you speak to um, the importance of considering slavery, colonialism, um, and of all of these intersecting forms of oppression. I really enjoyed uh, reading the paper in addition to the remarks that you've made here today. So. Uh, some of the metaphors that you used in terms of scar tissue, um, bounded justice offers us an explanation for why it was not just enough to uh, come up with vaccines and expect that to be the be all end all solution in communities of color. Uh, bounded justice helps us to understand why in places like Baltimore um, and in the sickle cell case that we can pour dollars into sickle cell research, we can pour into lists of things that we should do, we should prioritize, we can even put all the money we want into social determinants of health. And yet 50 years later, we are still asking and addressing some of the same questions that we have been asking for a very long time. Bounded justice helps us to understand why that is the case. I wanna start out um, <laughs> with sort of a personal question, um, if you'll allow me. Um, and that is just to briefly ask you to comment about uh, 
um, what led to you writing this paper now um, and in the moment? Uh, you started out and nicely, uh, you know, sort of included in your presentation a few words about um, your positionality. Uh, what led to this paper? Why now? Uh, and what's the story uh, behind that? Well, thank you, first of all, um, for those very kind remarks about bounded justice, um, particularly around um, the bolded piece. Um, and that's it's connected to um, how and why I think I've written this paper. I, um, Kamara Jones is a mentor and was part of my dissertation um, committee and still um, advises me. And uh, we worked together while I was working at the CDC. And if, um, if there's not a woman to inspire you to be bold, if there's not a woman to inspire you to um, ruffle feathers and to um, not take no for an answer, uh, it was Dr. Kamara Jones. And so I am 100% a legacy of um, her, her mentorship and friendship. Um, she, when I watched from afar as a, a young person who had just finished her MPH and just starting at the CDC, I watched Kamara struggle within the CDC to make racism um, as, uh, uh, as important as it has become mm -hmm. in um, the role of um, the main role of determinants um, in terms of social determinants of health. And I watched how at um, any, no matter what the point, um, she was steadfast. Um, and she, in um, my training and in my writing, has pushed me to um, ask, the, ask the questions and to not back down from um, the uncomfortable parts. Uh, and really, that's what anti-racism is, right? It's being comfortable with being uncomfortable um, and, and understanding that you are going to be disrupting um, norms. Um, so in terms of why now, mm -hmm. Dr. Neblet, um, why now is because I'm a very slow thinker and a very slow writer. And I've been thinking about bounded justice since I was in the field in 2014, 2015. Okay. And um, and I've been, I think, um, collecting um, empirical evidence, and I think I've been collecting lived experience, and I've been collecting observations, and um, and it coincided uh, to be released in this moment. Um, I think that whenever it would have been released would have been the time for it to be released, um, but it, I think it's important that it's been released in this particular moment in the wake of 2020, in the wake of the combined pandemics of racism and um, COVID-19, in the wake of the ways in which racism is being um, called to the forefront as, as a um, public health issue. And so I want us to question that as we are um, you know, engaging with what it means for racism to play the kind of role that we, some of us have always known that it plays, to make sure that it doesn't get co-opted, to make sure that there are actual meaningful actions behind it besides just a recognition. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm grateful that the timing is or was what it was um, and, and that um, now is the time for people to um, hear it and to apply it accordingly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think timely is an understatement um, and the work is all of the things uh, that you that you said uh, in terms of being bold, courageous, and and really um, saying, hey, we got to take a look at this, um, even if it makes us uncomfortable. Uh, one of the things that I really uh, that really resonated with me in the paper was this analysis around performativity politics. Uh, one of the things that many scholars have written about and talked about is this idea that um, you know, having webinars, uh, having workshops um, is not action. Uh, we need to be bolder um, and that we're repeating as you nicely illustrated and what a powerful image with the sickle cell uh, meeting uh, that these things uh, happen, but yet the, the results still seem to be the same or much doesn't seem to change. So I, I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about um, what you think performative performativity politics looks like um, in um, the university setting, uh, 
Um, and I guess more importantly, what should we do in the context of um, DEI? So uh, what should we replace performativity politics with? Yeah. Um, so I, um, I saw performativity politics most uh, pressing in my work throughout um, sickle cell disease particularly as a government official who was assigned um, to work on these things. Um, I saw the ways in which policies got um, uh, prioritized or deprioritized at the drop of a hat, who at the time became sponsors of bills, who um, you know, really put some intentionality behind what needed to happen. And we're talking about a, a disease that is um, well known and recognized, I think, globally um, to affect um, that there's just wholehearted neglect um, when it comes down to almost every aspect of, of the disease. And in fact, here we are in 2021, where, um, you know, NIH is specifically saying that we need to address the neglect of sickle cell um, specifically by offering a tool like gene therapy, right? So, mm -hmm. So there are all these levels of how I saw um, performativity occur in that space, um, particularly when it came to um, raising up black bodies um, in order to show how much um, we are willing to include them in the conversation or include them in the processes towards equity. Um, and, and I think what we do to replace that, I, you know, I'm going to go back to um, the theme of the, or the word of the day, which I think is disruption. Um, I, I think how we do that is um, we have to empower the community to disrupt institutions like University of Michigan. I, I think we have to empower um, those who may be seen as marginal um, when they are asked to join the workshops or the working groups or what have you, mm -hmm. that we have to arm people um, with the courage to disrupt when we see performativity politics happening at play. Um, I think that um, I think that there is a lot of risk involved. Um, in disruption, which I, I think I mentioned in, in my talk. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I think that risk has allowed for, per, per, for performativity to be as pervasive as it is. It's much easier, um, you know, to uh, get a diverse looking picture to give a, to give a, um, an idea and a feeling of inclusion and diversity. Um, and but then that's all that it is, right? It's just it's just this picture. And instead, what I'm asking for is, what if we brought those those diverse group of people and we sat them down, and then we talked to them about their life course, and we talked about um, if their students what it was that brought them to this place, what kind of obstacles did they have to overcome? Did you not have to overcome any obstacles? That's fine too, but we should own what that looks like in terms of positionality and privilege. Mm -hmm. and, and particularly when it comes to the School of Public Health, um, when we can strip that performativity away and we're allowed to be our most authentic self and we're able to be in a space where all of the different um, positionalities are valued um, and owned, then we may be able to create this space again to this this idea of vulnerability where we don't feel like it's so risky. Like the vul it's a we're able to be vulnerable in order to do better science, in order to engage better, um, in order to have the the programs and policies in place um, that may make a difference beyond just kind of um, um, keeping the status quo. Okay. Uh, I really like how you give some very specific and concrete examples um, of what the the solutions and what might replace performativity uh, politics uh, might look like. Um, I think sometimes, uh, as your analysis helps to point out, we don't even realize or performativity when it's occurring. So some cases are obvious if we're just you know putting <laughs> black 
folks, um, you know, using imagery, things of that nature. But as you point out, it's things like even when we're well intentioned, even when we're trying to be inclusive, not listening to the lived experiences of the people who are at the table. Uh, one of the things community partners uh, often uh, lament, at least in, in my conversations with them, is that you know there may be a one-up focus group or conversation, um, but there's not a sustained conversation where they are seen as equitable contributors to the table. So um, we may be engaging in uh, in what we think of as inclusive practices. We may be engaging even in community-based participatory research. Um, but um, as bounded justice helps us to realize, um, there are limits to to what we're going to realize because of the the underlying mechanisms. So uh, I, I appreciate you you calling attention to that. Uh, I want to pivot a little bit. I mean, it, it's sort of a, a transition, um, and just sit a little bit with the tension that the bounded justice concept raises. So. Uh, I think at the end of the day, you say, look, there are limits and, and you actually question whether distributive, distributive justice can be attained. I think you say it, it, it actually can't be, right? Um, and so that's a very sobering, uh, you know, sort of um, thing to, to sit with um, and to know that even when intentions are good, um, even when you bring people to the table, um, there's still going to be limits to what can be achieved. Um, and as I grappled with this and listening to you today and also reading the work, I thought, ah, you know, uh, what what do we do um, with the tension? Um, what is Dr. Carey's goal? You know, is it to just sort of highlight um, the fact that there's this um, tension um, and that we need to understand it better, um, or you know, do we need to you know sort of act on it? Um, I think you you've kind of addressed that um, in 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 the talk today. Um, so um, I was going to ask you, you know, are you so, sort of saying that the main point or just is to um, acknowledge that it exists, um, but would you agree that there is this tension with kind of praxis and action and that it's not only to recognize it, but to go beyond that? Yes, thank you so much for that question. I get this question a lot because I do think bounded justice is a bit sobering. I do think um, that the way that it's currently posited that um, what I'm saying is, is that it's never enough. So that that um, shouldn't we be happy with that thin slice of justice? Um, because as I said, it is affording, it is distributing some sort of justice. Um, it's not that it's not, um, it's not doing maybe what it intended. Um, I argue that that it's not living up to the same hype as, as we think, even in that thin slice, mm -hmm. but that's certainly not living up um, to um, how efficacious uh, the program, the technology, the policy is because of this, this much larger situation that a lot of these populations are sitting in. Um, and so there is certainly tension between um, you know, when is it enough? How, how can we think as practitioners, as interventionists, as researchers, how can we create something or begin to um, tackle what's underneath that iceberg, um, that image that I shared? We're talking about generations and generations um, that we're dealing with in terms of influence of um, enslavement, influence of colonialism, influence of um, hypervigilance, and you know all of these different um, things that have been occurring um, over millennia. And and to that point, I do think that it's a difficult ask. How can I can only do so much? Is what I hear. And so I don't want us to feel like we have to tackle that whole iceberg, but I want us to understand that when we are doing our best to, you know, provide the justice to create the space for health equity, that we do so intentionally understanding what is underneath and that we understand almost from the beginning that we're going to fail. And so if we think about failure from the outset, then we're able to be humble enough to work backwards and say, okay, we're not gonna meet that goal. What else can we do? What else can we do? 
reflection, what else can we do? Reflection, what else can we do? Yeah. Now, all this has to be supported, right? There's no time for a lot of reflection, what else can we do? Reflection, what else can we do? When you're on an NIH grant and you have two to five years to get these um, objectives done, right? And so the transformation that needs to happen can't take place only in a school of public health. It can't take place only at the University of Michigan. It has to take place across institutional norms and values mm -hmm. um, in the spaces where the infrastructure is built. And so what if this research infrastructure that is created already understands the infrastructure necessary for equity to thrive? And we understand that when we think about a place like NIH, that they, once they, or if they ever, you know, begin to understand the value of community-based uh, participatory research, or you know what it means to have um, a review panel with with um, with affected community members on that panel. You know, once they begin to transform, then we'll be allowed to better transform. And all of this, right, is attached to publication practices, is attached to citation practices, is attached to tenure, is attached to the ways in which scholars of color are productive in particular ways versus other scholars. All of this is very much, you know, implicated together in this really tightly woven um, network. And to change one thing is great, um, but that's bound to just as even in and of itself to work hard within a one unit to, to do these things. But while everything else is not changing, again, that justice is limited. Um, so it's a big question. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely tension. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, you know, the, the 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 answer that I often give is that we have to think about um, the way we develop interventions and programs and policies that we we do have this finite amount of time and finite amount of money but what if in conjunction to these discrete kind of acute phases of intervention towards equity that we provide that we somehow um, work to have the sustained long-term peace that's running along it. Um, that in and of itself is, is, a, is, a, is another conversation because that does um, require all of the moving parts to be on one accord so that we can have this generations long project, if you will, in which equity and this attempt to achieve equity um, doesn't stop even though these discrete projects start and stop all of the time. So what's happening in the background um, to ensure that there's some sort of sustainability um, uh, all the while attempting to uproot or unbind the justice? Mm. Um, yeah. it's, it's a big question um, well, and it, it's not very satisfactory. <laughs> yeah, it's a big question, but um, it's a great answer in terms of thinking about the interconnectedness of things. Uh, and um, I think it would be very easy for folks to look at the concept of bounded justice or read your paper and, and throw up their hands and say, well, <laughs> you know, given that we can achieve this, um, you know, why should we, why should we bother? Um, but uh, what I hear you saying in your response is that um, that's that's not what you're saying that we should just go home. Um, but there, there are lots of ways we've got to um, do this, and we've got to do it in a way that uh, you know is is humble. Um, humility is important. I love how you talk about the fact. Um, sorry, there's no checklist <laughs> for bounded justice, right? Um, uh, there's there's work to do, and it's hard work, and it and it has to be sustained. So. Um, even though it may feel like an unsatisfying answer, uh, I, I think you uh, give us a lot to think about. Yeah, and I think that towards the justice part that Whitney introduced for us and that I took up very briefly, it's about always reaching towards the potential, um, always knowing that we can be better than the version of ourselves that we are now and understanding um, that it's in the the steps that it's going to take, right? It took, it took so much time for us to get here. Um, it also took power plays, and it took um, white supremacy, and it took you know 
white supremacist policies to all of these things are uh, will take tremendous amounts of time to untangle. Um, but again, it's why I think bounded justice requires for us to have a reset, because if our yeah. values are situated in these same things that created um, these tensions and these oppressive forces to begin with, there's no way, no matter our best intent, no matter how much we try with DEI initiatives, no matter how much we try to create an anti-racist program, and I am trying to create anti-racist programs, you know, I yeah. I sit in the tension of what is this really going to do at the end of the day when the forces um, against it really are so strong. Um, and we see it in today's news against critical race theory, yeah. um, but we don't need it to be so blatant, right? We also see it in all kinds of discursive ways um, in which, in which again, the status quo gets replicated because I think um, to be pushed towards transformation means a lot of work and a lot of really uncomfortable conversations. And again, a lot of risk, who wants to be the first? Um, right, I say, right. let's take that risk, you know, let's right. let's be one of the few that, that um, takes the charge of the transformation needed in this field. Right. Yeah, well, the 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 risk is there, but you're you're pushing us to to kind of um, push through that uncomfortable, um, you know, feeling to take the risk. Um, and I think that's really important. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the role of education, but I've just received a signal that we need to wrap up. So I, I think what I will do um, is just give you the, the last word and ask you uh, for a kind of parting thought um, that you'd like to leave us with, uh, kind of take home message, um, and then we'll we'll call it a wrap. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, obviously, this is a conversation I think we could, you know, take up a whole hour um, yeah, sure. to, to have. Yeah. Um, I I want I want us to um, to be braver in the ways in which we operate as students, the way we operate as faculty, the way we operate as administrators, the way we operate as um, researchers. Um, I want us to look um, past notions of um, if it's just safer um, and more comfortable if we keep doing things the same way. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I, I talk about very briefly is about what this moment calls for. And I want to almost backtrack because I think that what this moment calls for is something that has always been called for, which is essentially dignity and respect. Yeah. But what this moment has forced us to do in terms of 2021 um, as, as part of the legacy of the um, double pandemic, of the, um, the police brutalities that we saw during the pandemic, of um, the killings we continue to see mm -hmm. um, of black and brown people um, that that it's all interconnected you know when i'm when i'm thinking about this anti-racist um mooc that i'm developing through the school of public health mm -hmm. um you know it's specifically about disrupting hierarchy but also the important part I think of it is this understanding of that what happens outside of the classroom influences what happens inside of the classroom. Um, and so until we can, I think, reckon with the ways that lived experiences um, really show themselves on all levels, again, in all these different positionalities, researcher, student, faculty member, that we take those positionalities, we we own them, um, we understand or try to understand um, the vulnerability in which all of us are bringing to the situation um, to begin with, particularly when it comes to the work of, of, of um, equity making. I think equity making itself is a, a vulnerable practice so that we honor that vulnerability, we 
honor and own the positionality that we all take. We honor and own the privilege that we all sit in in different levels because we all sit in some sort of level of privilege, some of us more than others. Um, we honor and, and understand the way that oppression has worked for other people if it, does, if it hasn't worked for us. And then we take all of these things and then we we attempt to to shift the field bit by bit, bit by bit, bit by bit. That we disrupt when someone says something in a faculty member, in a faculty um, um, meeting uh, that's inappropriate or there's a search that's happening and we don't, um, we're uncomfortable with the way that conversations are being had about certain candidates. Um, we respectfully um, push back um, uh, as best we can, understanding that anger is owed and due to certain people, right? But the, that, that, you know, we understand our positions. We understand that um, we all have a stake. Um, I think when you're in public health in this particular moment in time, especially as racism is being called out the way that's being called out for public health, each and every one of us has a stake in mm -hmm. some way. You could be teaching accounting. Um, you could be, you know, uh, teaching biostats. You could be um, uh, teaching um, environmental health. You could be, I can go down the list of our departments, right? We each have a stake, um, whether we see it or not, whether we recognize it or not. So to understand that stake um, and then to try and act accordingly, situating yourself in discomfort and situating yourself in disruption. Yeah. Long-winded. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, these are this is important, um, and you've given us a lot to think about um, today. Um, I want to encourage folks uh, to um, read Dr. Creary's paper uh, and her scholarship um, on uh, bounded justice. Um, I want to encourage once this hopefully becomes available for you to share these ideas with others. Uh, there were a lot of gems um, that I heard uh, in, in just sitting here today uh, with regard to how we can do this work that I think can be applied to not only DEI work, um, but um, work writ large. So um, Dr. Creary, thank you very much um, for being our guest today. Um, it's been an honor um, to be in conversation with you. Um, and I look forward to seeing how this uh, concept continues to develop as we do this important work. Dr. Peoples. Thank you so much uh, to both Dr. Creary and Dr. Nevlet. This was amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm just so excited and so grateful for this. I want to say thank you to everyone so much for joining us this afternoon and just take a, a moment to really offer a special thanks to the folks that have made this possible. Uh, in addition to the brilliance and the genius of Dr. Creary and Dr. Neblet, I also need to acknowledge and thank Michael Kasaborski and the marketing and communications team here at the School of Public Health. I would like to thank the lovely team from Michigan Media and my colleagues on the DEI team, which include Dr. Enrique Neblet, but also Dr. Marie O'Neill. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>